So I'm going to give a talk, basically take you back in time to uh, some of you who are, who are at the age of 30 or 40 will remember this time. Back in the weird 80s, uh, there were lots of strange 8-bit computers that everybody created to do some of these. Now these are a lot quite UK-centric, so um, some of them you might not recognise. So there were machines like the BBC Micro, um, the Commodore 64, which is popular in the US, the ZX Spectrum, the Auric. Um, so some of you in the US might remember TRS-80, so TI-99, 48. There were also consoles like the Sega, the Mega Drive, uh, the Nintendo Massacom, or the Famicom, as the US call it, and the PlayStation. Of course, my parents didn't buy many of those. They bought something called the Sharp MZ700, which was useless. Um, so, yeah. Um, but in the past few years, people have been going, um, oh, we remember those computers. They were really good. So they've been, other companies have like gone out and they've tried to pay them to try and get on this retro nostalgia trip. And, uh, basically give people a chance to play the old games and then they realise the rubbish that they, so these re consoles are, uh, uh, are just basically left behind and never used again. So one thing just before I originally wrote this, this slide came up on uh, Twitter, um, which just to show you, uh, when we talk retro, Xbox 360 is now officially retro. That's quite a scary thing. So anyway, I'm going to talk about th about two. So uh, let me restart. I've got I bought went out and bought a couple of these. So there's um, in the top left you'll see what's called the ZX Vega, which is basically a Spectrum. The Mini C64. Now there's recently come out a Maxi C64, but I couldn't get hold of one. And a PlayStation Classic. Now two of these I will tear down. Um, this sort of came out about a conversation which I had with a friend about what was running on that ZX Vega. Um, and you know how is this meant to work? So there is, they can't be connected to internet. There is no technical security risk, but the techniques to go through to find out this sort of thing are really what we've been using when we do an assessment to something. So let's start with this, with the ZX Faker. So um, the first thing you do is just try and make an assumption: how's it running? So if I was to write this, I'd do a basic Linux system and I would put um, run the basic the, the largest spectrum I'm going to call fuse on it and then I'd just run away you know a sort of visual interface. So I've got a bit of a video I want to sort of demonstrate how it works. So wait for uh, Google to cache. So this is it at this point I've only got a circuit board so it might be a bit slow um, when I video this because I'm using a pair of tweezers to sort of press the buttons. Um, as you can see, it's quite a bit uh, very old school of 80s. Uh, I'm just loading up a game here just to see how easy it is to play. And uh, yeah, I'm not really very good at that game. So one of the other facilities that this has is you can load custom code into it. So you can, it's got an SD card and you can put on um, a Spectrum Snap and put on an SD card. So when I first presented this was the piece I was and I built my own little demo. So anyway, let's uh, leave that up behind. So when we look at some hardware, basic routes we can go, we can look at the firmware, we can look at the hardware, and we can look at the software that runs on it. And all three of these may present avenues for attack. So I'm going to start off with the firmware, which is my favorite thing in the world, which is hex dumps. And you better really like Hexums because there's quite a few of these. So when you're looking at this, the first immediate thing that springs out to mind is this massive string here where we can see a version number, we can see um, a data release, and we can see basically a copyright string. If we go a bit further into the detail itself, we can try and break out the actual binary and the hex as above that. We can see a magic number. We can see that date that we see below 20, 2015, September, 9th of September 2015. And we can see that version number. The information around it, we can see a file size. And then we've got some 
rough padding bites. So in C, that's a sort of rough C structure that we can sort of work out about the header. <coughs> then it goes on to a second header, which is basically an SPI configuration block, which is described in the um, data sheet for the actual CPU point uh, inside the device itself. There's not really much you can get from that, so we can safely ignore most of it. Then we have next, we have another block um, behind that, which we can actually then, let, that's a standard block for the, uh, for, for the MTU that's in place, which is an XBI MX. So we can then look deep into that, and there's a program that I managed to find called SB Tool, which would allow me to dump it. So I've dumped the header there. There's one important thing that comes from that. It's an encrypted image. So basically, can't get any further with doing this. So let's have a look at the hardware. This is the front of the board. There are three things that sort of pop out. There's the MCU, which is an IMX233. So it's an ARM core device that can do, it's actually a really powerful chip for what it is. It can basically do all the audio, all the uh, monitor stuff, and control everything. We have DRAM, which is basically system memory, system RAM. And we have SPI flash memory, which is long-term storage for the device. On the back side, the only thing that we've really got of interest, we can see loads of buttons, and we've got these three sets of pads here, which could be all various different interesting things. <coughs> so, um, first thing to do is try and read out that data. Now, flash ROM failed to work on it. It failed to identify that flash chip. So, I've fortunately, I've talked about SPI before, and SPI flash is quite a common technique to see, and you can basically read it from Python. So the program we're using there is called SPI, and it's a Python script that I wrote, uh, which I can just read stuff. And then there's a sort of one-click web interface I did to try and read it. I sort of munged the script a bit to get it to work, but eventually I could read it out. And it's exactly the same as found in the firmware, so it's encrypted. That's not going to get me very far. So next step, let's have a look at the hardware. So we can see those pads are interested. So the first thing we can do now is to use a multimeter and continuity mode to try and buzz things out. So we know from uh, the, uh, the front side that, that some of these pins are um, in the top header are ground and some of them are positive five volts. So we can buzz those out. So the ground pins I've just highlighted in black. Um, and they're easy enough to find and to see where sort of the grounds are. And the reds, you can see it, but there's one at the top header as well. And that's positive 5 volts. Let's go into it. Let's have a look at junction 4. J4, sorry. And we can mark out the earth, the ground, sorry. And then we can mark out and we can mark, find out which pin it is by running the uh, multimedia continuity mode. We find that we've got TX and RX for UART, which is a UART port. That's generally quite good. J3. Uh, the one on the left goes to ground through a capacitor, so that's why it won't buzz out to, gr to ground, but it eventually, it eventually goes to ground. Um, second one is, is called an SJ tag debug line. So SJ tag is a one pin J tag port, um, which is a very complicated and proprietary protocol. So I have to, uh, you need adaptive ports to use this, and it's quite rare to actually find them. And the other one is just basically voltage reference. Um, so let's, if we look at the junction at J5 at the top, so if we mark these out, we can see that should look familiar already. It looks very similar to a micro USB port. So we can sort of make um, a guess of how that works. And we can sort of say, look at familiar. So we can see 5 and 1 are ground plus 5 volts. 4 is the identification pin, which is basically either floating or ground which tells you whether it's a host or a device. And the other two are USB, D, DP, and DN for data plus and data minus. So we can then try and buzz those out, and hey presto, we buzz those out to be a USB port. So this is all the ports mapped out, and I'm hoping you can see that. So um, the next thing to do is to try and actually solder some wires to this and to actually attempt to view it. So first thing we go is for the UART port. 
Now, those people in the UK who have used the BBC Micro uh, would recognise that screen, it's very familiar. Um, so that's basically a bit of a joke. Um, it's not really very much helpful, I can't get a shell on there. Um, what I can get is error messages, which was very useful later on. <clears throat> so we can't do anything with that one. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to that USB header. Now, I apologize for the photography here. I just moved house and I haven't unpacked my microscope. So this is all done on my uh, iPhone camera. So I rigged up a sort of basically a, um, a, a, a sort of deeper board to allow, us, allow me to actually connect across. So there's a sort of complicated, that's using an SJTAG adapter board through an Olimex OCD device to connect to the, to the board itself. Oh, sorry. Let me go back. Um, I didn't get anything from that one. It, 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 enum it didn't enumerate. All I could get was power. So then the next final one is the JTAG, the SJTAG board which is why I'm using um, an adapter board, which is proprietary technology, and I can't find any details about it, so I have to use their board through uh, an Olimex OCD device, which then connects to the board itself. At this point, I'll just show you my desk at this time, because I've got a fully populated USB hub there where I'm monitoring everything from the device itself. What you can't see is under the desk is a Velcro USB hub which is providing power to all the different boards I'm using to get this image. If it doesn't produce HDMI output, I have to also use an AV converter to view this in a monitor. Um, quite a lot of USB going on there. Anyway, running through the SJ tag using OCD, um, I can connect directly to it. That is what you'd see in a successful connection. So I'm using the, the Olimex ARM USB interface and I connect into an IMX233. <clears throat> I can now then connect, I can hold CPU and I can see what looks like information the registers. The important one here is if you look at uh, register 15 which is a process counter, I get a valid address that is in the RAM allocation for the chip so I know that is roughly valid. So next thing to do is look at the memory map on the data sheet for the IMX233. So we can see then tests that we can read. We can read from on-chip SRAM, which is basically the secure bootloader. Uh, again, it's a familiar string, and also what we're seeing here is ARM code. So that EA on the top nibble um, of the fourth octet generally is the ARM code for always. So that means that the instructions always read. So it's a very quick way of working out 50-bit ARM, is look at every fourth byte is that octet. That is the top nipple and E. <clears throat> so going into the on-chip ROM, we can read that. Now, it's a stat, it's again, it's a bit more bootloaded, so when it boots up, it takes the on-chip ROM and it will read through that. Um, it's exactly what I'd expect on IMX233, but I found a rather strange message in there. So apparently no pygmies were harmed during this testing. Um, not certain why, is that, why, is that, why that is there, but that's standard. Uh, for the IMX. So, next one is the external DRAM. So, this is actual RAM. Um, and as you can see, this is the area where PC is based. So, we're actually getting proper 32 bit ARM code here. Um, <clears throat> I can't dump ROM easily because the IMX uses um, a method of paging ROM in and out, and you have to do a bit. You have to basically pull data in, decrypt it. I could have done it I, if I'd spent enough time, but you know, by this point I had better things to do. So um, I just basically made the assumption. So if I'm running an emulator, then if I started going, that emulator should be paged into RAM, and I should be able to do RAM, and then you look for artifacts that look like an emulator. So uh, oh, we see at the top is the first few bytes of the Spectrum ROM, which I've taken from a general emulator online. So if I can find that in the memory, then I can know that an emulator is running. I can pretty much say that it's paged in. So I ran it, pulled the memory, and then dumped it, and hey presto, at that address, which I'm not going to try and read out because it's quite long, is the Spectrum. Uh, 
is, is basically the Spectrum ROM. So I know that I've got an emulator, I know that the Spectrum ROM's paged in, so that I know that the data's paged in. I look for artifacts for Fuse, which is the most common emulator, and I could not find any. Um, it's unfortunate, but there are no streams and nothing to highlight that Fuse has been run. So I can't really guarantee for that. So the last thing to look at is that software. First off, simple attacks. Can I, uh, can I do a few shell breakouts? And no, I can't, which I would suggest that they either uh, neutralize everything or they run um, on raw iron. There's not an operating system there. I'm looking at the other things from the RAM, the operating system isn't there. So there is one avenue left to attack, which is the emulator itself. So let's go back into time. This is a die of a Z80 microprocessor. Um, I stole it from online. There's a lot of information about this um, inside it. I'm specifically looking here at the, back in the bottom right corner. Those are the registers for the Z80. So this is going back in time a bit. The Z80 is basically a machine code compatible version of the Intel 8080 with a few extensions. So let's talk about some registers. I'm going to read through this one because it's not really that exciting. There are um, a set of 8-bit registers that can be combined into 16-bit, so A, F, B, C, D, E, H, L. There's a duplicate set of those that can be swapped in and out. Uh, index registers, which are for indexing stuff in memory. Program counter, an interrupt register. And finally, something called WZ, which is used um, as a temporary store buffer. So uh, because the ZET is only 8-bit, it can't store 16 bits easily so it's got it so what it does is it loads into the wz register and in theory you can't ever access that from machine code except there's a book <coughs> and certain instructions like the bit nhl instruction will leak out bits of wz so this is sort of interesting because in uh, the mid 2000s before we mapped out um, um, uh, Z80 properly. WZ was not known about. The, the way that this worked in the back end wasn't quite certain, so many emulators, including Fuse, budged it and always returned uh, one, you know, uh, either, either all bits higher or bits low. Uh, in about 2010 ish, um, it was discovered in a lot of emulators were updated. So any emulator that was written since 2010 roughly would understand the WZ and uh, show the instructions and show the behavior of understanding the WZ register. Anything before won't. I would sort of race through here. So I wrote a bit of code. This is a bit of Z80 code that will basically load a value into uh, WZ, set to a known value. To the instruction, I will leave memory in it, and the rest of it is just getting the information back. So I put this in the Spectrum Basic program, which took bloody ages to type in an emulator, um, and then run it. This is what would happen on, on uh, zxspectrum.net, which supports WZ. I get all passes. If I run this on Fuse, uh, well, an old version of Fuse, Fuse now supports it, but there's a sort of that was 2018, I think that change happened it fails. So there are proper test suites that do this properly, <clears throat> and I chose one called Raxoff. This is a whole range of tests. So the spectrum.net passes it. If I run it on the Vega, it all fails. So to me, this tells me that this is an emulator that does not support WZ. So it is most likely the core of Fuse, but I can't prove it. So um, I've literally got five minutes left, so I'm going to have to race a bit further. On to the C64 Mini. Uh, so this came out from the same people who did the ZX Vega, um, but in, for a different company. <coughs> um, it's actually a totally different board, and it's very done in a totally different way. So let's have a quick look at the firmware. Anybody who's doing any reverse engineering can see immediately there's an ELF header. And that byte 28 says that it's ARM code. You can see basically um, file offset, so we can see how big the file is. And I didn't sort of tweak this until I started actually writing a slide that says AC64, AC64. There's um, a load more file offset stuff. 
as we go through, and there's some, basically some chunk data that, that, that goes through. <coughs> now, if we load this into Kickler, we can actually start decompiling. So there's no debugging information, but what they have left in are strings. Um, as any reverse engineer will tell you, we like strings. They give us clues and tell us about stuff. So in this case, we can see um, basically telling us that G, G cry cipher set IP failed, which tells us that they're using the G crypt, which is basically where that function is used. So if I expand, so a bit of mangling around, I, we can see that um, <clears throat> if I change the function names a bit to sort of mess up, I can see where it is actually setting up the encryption to decrypt the rest of that, that, that file. So we've got cipher open, a setting key, and a set IV. So that is the code where it sets the key. Now, what that's doing is messing around with emptiness. That's decompile code. I'm not quite certain what it does, and I can reverse it, but it'll take a long time. So what a cheaty way of doing this is, let's just run the executable and then use something like GDB to interrupt it and actually see what the key is. So I don't have an ARM device that I could use. I could probably uh, use a Raspberry Pi, but I'll be honest, it's easy to use something called QMU. Now, QMU is a basically, it's a system emulator which can emulate a number of different CPUs. But one of the nice features is you can run an a, a unit, sorry, you can run an executable uh, in QMU in a sandbox on your own machine, whatever it is, and then you can attach DPV directly to it. So um, this is basically what I'm going to do. So I'm looking for this in inside the function, which is at this address, and I'm looking for those two parameters that have been passed to it, R2 and R3, which are the key in the IV. So here's a video of me actually running all this in one go. I will apologize, there are typing errors in this. It's really, I had to redo this video about four times. So I'm using QMU to load it up in the single step mode so that it won't, it will start pause. And I'm telling it to start GDB on that process. Start off GDB. And I'm connecting across to it. <clears throat> so there were breakpoints so, so that it dumps me back in control when it gets to a cipher. And then run the program, and now it's reached that breakpoint, so I can just dump the registers. So this is dumping register two. I don't normally type that slow, by the way. Um, dumping register three. So you can see I've got the key and I've got the IV. So, so that's useful. I could decompile it from there. But also at this point, um, I did a Google search, which I should have really done at the start. I found out that people have already found a UART port on it, which is um, sort of there on it. I'd already soldered the header to it by this point, but I got a bit carried away. There's also two buttons which allow you to get into the fail mode, which is basically the bootloader. So if I run this, it gets me through to a command prompt, uh, sorry, a login prompt. And importantly, there's a hit any key to start auto boot. So let's rerun that and we press the key on boot and we're into the bootloader. So we can actually see that that is a command that it runs. We can change that so that the bootloader and then boot from RAMFS, which means you get to a shell prompt. From shell prompt, we can cut as shadow. I haven't been able to crack that password. But what we can do is we can change that password. But then we get into a shell and with one minute to go, that's the end of the presentation. We think about IoT Village as a movement. These devices are being adopted so rapidly that security is not effectively being baked into the development and deployment of those solutions. That puts consumers at risk, that puts businesses at risk, that puts governments at risk. And what we're trying to do is to galvanize a community around solving that problem. Every time somebody hears IoT, they immediately think, I don't want this in my house. 
But as time goes by, that choice of having something in your house or not is not really there. You can walk in the village, you won't feel like you're asking a dumb question, and you'll still walk away learning something no matter what your skill level is or knowledge. IoT Village provides an opportunity for people to experience security in a very tangible, very real way. So what ends up happening is, I can kill Lisa right now. She's being <laughs> smothered. She's flatlining, patient monitor's going nuts, she's dead. What's going on at the nurse's station? She's fine. What I'm doing right now is we are replaying recorded data of a healthy patient. So this patient monitor is something you'd see in every hospital room in America probably. The IoT Village seeks to raise awareness of IoT security. We want consumers to be able to make informed decisions and we want manufacturers to improve their security. So we put a lot of work into the security on the Bird 2 and we wanted to put it in front of the DEF CON community and see what people were able to do with it. We've learned stuff about our tech that we didn't previously know and from my perspective that's phenomenal because we have a really talented team internally but when we can be educated by people external to the company it's a big, big win. We really want to show that uh, we very much welcome the work that uh, security researchers do and uh, even though we work in the world, the medical device world, that's not as accessible to uh, the people that work in this space. We really value the input that uh, researchers have. We want to show that we, uh, we love for them to work with us on uh, our medical devices and uh, what they can find in it. Security is a mission critical part of being a pioneer and by participating in this they're able to address some of the challenges that are introduced through innovation. Building a contest to challenge hackers, you know, at the world's biggest hacker conference, if these guys didn't know what they were doing, this room would be empty. So IoT Village is awesome. Unfortunately, like a lot of hackers work in these uh, small groups. They don't really share a lot of information because they kind of want to monetize or capitalize off of the information that they have. So being here in IoT Village gives us an opportunity to talk to a bunch of other hackers that we wouldn't normally talk to and share information and kind of like come together as one. I think it is the best thing since sliced bread, personally. This year we're here at DEF CON helping run a uh, hands-on lab, IoT Hacking 101. How do we get people involved with this? Because it might be intimidating, right? Walking up into a big CTF at a big conference. The idea is that we handhold them all the way through from the basics of firmware analysis right through to discovering a bug and popping a device or two. I just connected over NetCat. There was nothing fancy, no authentication, anything like that. And this number here is your authentication token. It's a serial number on the device. That's what they're using for authentication. So what we're doing is that we're showing people how we find vulnerabilities in embedded devices. Specifically, I've been targeting NAS devices, and I've been showing how we find vulnerabilities, develop an exploit for it, and exploit it from the attacker's perspective. IoT Village is the face of IoT security worldwide. They're probably the most preeminent brand when it comes to dealing with IoT security. We have expertise, they have expertise, and we feel that it's more than just a sponsorship, it's more of a partnership in which we share stuff with each other. The visibility that you get from all of these conferences is, a, is an amazing thing. It's only going to get more and more relevant, and the devices are only going to get more and more prevalent. And so I think it's just a great interactive, hands-on experience for people to come and get immersed. We know that these security challenges that are inherent within connected devices, they're not going away on their own. We're able to make these challenges come alive, to become real, to be tangible. And when we do that, we enable people to participate in being part of the solution.